Now, we've been looking at the book of James, and we've actually gotten, uh, for this week, we're going to be starting chapter 2. We got through chapter 1 last week, and this week we're going to go through chapter 2. Uh, I dare say I should be able to keep this session to about an hour, uh, since we are starting late. And uh, But we're going to see how far we can get, okay? We're beginning now with James chapter 2. And the first 13 verses deal with the issue of favoritism. This is something that we're all familiar with. Uh, when you belong to a club or you belong to an organization or even your job, a lot of times the bosses show favor to certain people. And they've got their little pets. You know, when you were a kid, they used to talk about the teacher's pet, you know. Uh, certain kids, the teacher let get away with murder and do all kinds of things. And uh, favoritism in the church is forbidden. And James talks about the uh, fact that favoritism is not consistent with New Testament Christianity. And it's funny because this is something that you see every day in many churches. Uh, I've heard about churches uh, in our area, including some big mega churches, and they actually have pews that are set aside up front so they can make sure the people who are at those pews get on camera. And that's where all their celebrity guests are invited to sit. Because they want to make sure everybody knows, hey, these celebrities visiting old brother so-and-so's church. And we want, and then I've been told about churches that uh, actually have reserved seating down in the main body. Talking about mega churches, in the main body, where all their high power tithers, people that give a lot of money, set. They actually are giving preferred seating. That is inconsistent with biblical Christianity. The poorest person in the church has every right to sit right down front in front of the preacher as well as the richest person in the church. Whether you're black, whether you're white, with whatever your race, whatever your background, uh, you have every right to stand on level on a level playing ground with the rest of the believers in the church. There ought to be absolutely no form of favoritism in God's church. And this is something that uh, being old-time Pentecostal, I grew up, and this was something we very strongly believed in. And that is one reason why when a, a minister visits a church in a white Pentecostal church, to be honest with you, uh, he may come in with his wife or whoever and sit down back here, and the pastor will acknowledge him a lot of times, ask him to testify, you know, that sort of thing. But then they'll sit there for the service. Wherever they chose to sit is where they sit. In the black church, uh, there's a tradition where they'll invite ministers to come up and sit on the platform. And I don't mind that. I, I don't really see that so much as an issue of favoritism. You know, they're not trying to give you a better, a, a better advantage point or, you know. Uh, but what they're trying to do is respect and honor the fact that you're a man of God or a woman of God and you're in ministry, you know. Uh, but favoritism is something that uh, we absolutely must guard against. Because if there's anything that can turn people off fast, it's going to a church where some people are favored and others are not. And I'm, I'm going to get way ahead of myself, so we might as well get into the text. Might as well get into the text and then I'll expound further. So the first 13 verses of chapter 2, James, deal with the issue of favoritism as it is forbidden in the New Testament church. James writes, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come in unto your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, 
And ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him. But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats. Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called. If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy, that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. I kind of going to start at the end of this passage, <laughs> and then go back to the beginning, because it's important to understand, remember, this book is probably the first epistle written, in terms of time frame and chronological order, okay? James is probably the first. They think it may possibly have been right after Ephesians. So it's either the first or second epistle that was written. All right? You notice that James still has a very heavy... We talked about this when we were setting it up and laying out the, um, the uh, basic uh, blueprint of the book, you know, the outline. We talked about the fact that there was still a very heavy Jewish influence in his writing. Because at this point in the life of the church, it was still, Christianity was still an offshoot of the Jewish faith. And there really wasn't so much of a, uh, a Gentile presence, a non-Jewish presence in the church. So therefore, James is writing, and he's almost writing with that assumption that all the Christians are Jewish. And they're familiar with the law. And they're familiar with uh, what the, the law taught us and what the law says. So you see that heavy Jewish influence in his writing. And he refers to the law down in the second uh, half, roughly, of this particular uh, set of verses. And he speaks of the fact that uh, the law says, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And he speaks of the fact that uh, what I appreciate is he says, Showing partiality and showing favoritism is a sin. Mm -hmm. It is in direct contradiction to everything that is godly, Everything that is holy, God's people do not behave. Do you remember when I talked last week or so about how James said that pure religion and undefiled before the Father is this. And, and he said, keeping yourself unspotted from the world. One of the ways that the church has allowed itself to become spotted by the world, they've allowed the world to rub off on the church is through the practice of favoritism. Mm -hmm. 
That is a worldly attitude. That is a worldly way of conducting yourself. When you come into the church of Jesus Christ, this should not even be an issue. Uh -huh. You shouldn't see this. When you come into the church, things ought to be very different in the church than they are in the world. Uh -huh. Part of the problem we have in the church today is that you come into the church house and things are done very much the same here as they're done anywhere else. You've got your VIP rooms. You've got your VIP seating. You know, it's like a nightclub. It's like a fancy restaurant. And this is not the way the church ought to operate. I love the way that James refers to it in verse 8. He said, if ye fulfill the royal law, According to the scripture. The royal law. See we are citizens of heaven. Hallelujah to God. Uh -huh. Even though we live here. And if we're going to fulfill the royal law. God's law. Which is a higher law. A better law. Uh -huh. Than a secular worldly carnal law. He said then you will not show partiality you will love your neighbor as yourself you're going to treat people the way you desire to be treated riverside church one of the things that i loved about riverside church we had a little lady in our church who was very poor several people that went there uh, basically were very poor people didn't have a lot of money. A lot. There was a good number of people. The people there that did very well. There were people there that you know barely scraped by. I guess you might say. And uh, this one little lady came to church, and boy, I mean to tell you, she'd sit her little self down on that second pew, but you know, on the right hand side as you're walking down the center aisle, you know, and she'd sit herself down there, and she had every right to access that place at the front. And on the other side of the pew, most of the time, be Sister Gillum. Mm -hmm. And so you got the preacher's wife, and you got Sister <coughs> Alexander, a dear, sweet, precious lady, sitting on the same pew. And that's how the church ought to be. Uh -huh. you, you, you ought to have the wealthy and the poor. You ought to have the homed and the homeless sitting on the same pew because the way we conduct ourselves ought to be so contrary to the way the world conducts its business. And the minute the church begins to emulate the world, the minute we allow the world to dictate how we do things in the house of God, there is a problem. Amen. The Word of God, I'll tell you, the Word of God teaches us that we're not to go to law with a brother, with a person uh, in the faith. Mm -hmm. Word of God said, you don't do that. What do you do? Well, now the scriptures do tell us what to do. The Word of God said, take one of the church members who are the least esteemed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't look for one that, oh, brother, you know, King is a great man of God. He's a marvelous man of God and full of wisdom and blah, blah, and let him judge over the matter. No, it says take one that is the least esteemed. My word, have mercy. And you let that person hear the facts. And you let that person decide what's right and what's wrong in that matter. Uh-huh. Oh boy, why would you do that? Because it helps to prevent favoritism. Uh -huh. It helps to eliminate the possibility of, well, after all, if Brother King is a big hot shot in the church, and you know, and if, if one of the people in the matter happens to be another big shot like him, then he might lean toward him just by reason of their position. By reason of their reputation, what have you. So I said, no, 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 go to one of the one of those that are a little simple-minded, that are a little more, uh, don't have the clout, don't have the reputation. Let them decide in the matter. Because they're likely to be less clouded by all this other foolishness. And that's one way that God literally built into the system. A way that we can avoid falling victim to favoritism and showing partiality. 
Tommy can tell you, we have had people come to our church. And over the last 10 years since we've been here in Dallas, we've had people come to our church. And we've had some real tough characters. I mean, I'm not kidding. We've had folks come that were very, very, very difficult to deal with. They had emotional issues. They had psychiatric issues. They had psychological issues. They had developmental issues. Uh, they had mental health issues. And I had people who literally would say to me, well, I, I just wish they'd quit coming. I, you know, I, I just don't even like to come if I've got to deal with them. And I had to respond to them, Jack, and say, we're either going to live what we preach or we're not. We're either going to say what we say we're going to, we're either going to do what we say we're going to do or we're not. We claim that we believe God loves everybody, regardless of who they are, where they come from, what state of mind they're in, what have you. We believe God's a miracle working God. We believe God can help these people uh -huh. and lift them up. He can, he can strengthen their mind. He can strengthen their emotions. He can heal their hurts. You know, he can do all these things that are necessary to help them get on better footing. Right. But if we cut them off, then the Lord is not able to do for them because the church, which represents Jesus, has cut them off. Uh -huh. And I said, no, if you want to leave, leave. I'll keep them. We've lost people. Mm -hmm. Because they didn't want to live without partiality. They did not want to live without favoritism. They didn't they wanted to be picky and choosy about who they worshiped with. Right. And they expected the pastor to be part of their program. Pick and I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. As long as they are not disruptive to the work of God, as long as they are not purposely uh being distractive, or as long as they are not being destructive, you know, in some way, then they're welcome. Even if their personality is a little hard to deal with, even, you know, even if they tax you a little bit. Honey, I'm going to tell you, it's good experience. It helps you to develop patience. It helps you to develop sympathy. It helps you to develop empathy. It really helps you to develop as a human being to have some of these people in your life. And it helps you to develop your Christian character. Uh -huh. And so I have stood beside people and for people who others were saying, you know, well, we need, you know, we need just let them go. We, we don't need them to come to church. And I've heard that from people. And, uh, but I thank God for a church that when God's people come together, you know, we sing. The song that says, bind us together, Lord, bind us together. And I'm going to tell you, when I sing that song, uh, for me, it is not just words. That's right. That is a prayer. You are praying a prayer. You are singing a prayer. Bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together. Bind us together with love. And that ought to be what the world sees when it comes to the church door. It ought to see the oneness in the faith. It ought to see the unity in the faith. It ought to see love among the brethren regardless of skin color, regardless of age differences, uh, regardless of whether a man's dressed like a woman or a woman dressed like a man or however you want to look at it or call it. There ought to be love and there ought to be acceptance and there ought to be uh, in complete absence of partiality and favoritism. Amen. All right. So James tells the church, he said, hey, you know, aren't the rich people, aren't these the people that do poor folk dirty? Aren't these the very ones who when you owe them a little bit of money, they're going to drag you to court and they're going to sue you till they get what they got coming to them? He said, and yet... They'll be the very ones that you will fall over backwards trying to accommodate when they walk through the door of the church. And that's how the world operates. That is not how the church functions. Amen. I have, uh, I do not practice. I've been part of churches. Growing up as a kid, we had a pastor who came into our church, Brother Barlow. And he was a good man. I love him to death. But he 
he was very gifted at PR. Boy, I'll tell you, he knew, and, and the church grew, so his tactics worked. But he was one of these preachers who would have, you know, on special occasions, the mayor of the city would be in the service. Or a senator would be in the service. Or a congressman would be in the service. And that man would be sitting up on the platform. Why? Why? See, at least in the black church, it's ministers that come to the platform. And part of the reason that they invite ministers to the platform is when the opportunity comes to minister to people, all the ministers are up front where they can lay hands on people and pray with people, you know. But what's this politician got to do with the work of the kingdom? Not a thing. Yet, they play footsies with politicians, and they do everything in their power, Booby, to make sure that they show these people great favoritism and great partiality. It is wrong. It is sin. It is, in James' words, <coughs> evil. Look at verse 4. It's evil. Ungodly. Contrary to God. God don't work that way. His people don't work that way. His kingdom doesn't work that way. And therefore, the church ought not to work that way. All right, I'm going to try to move past this now. I'm kind of going through that quick, but I think the point is made. And we're going to go to uh, the part that I've been real excited about covering. And that is verses 14 through 26, where James talks about the connection between faith and works. That's I'm using the term works because that is what we read in the King James Version. What he's talking about in this instance is deeds or actions. Too many people have tried for centuries to discredit and discount what James writes in the book of James because they don't like the term works that they read in this portion that we're about to read in a moment. The truth of the matter is, I've described this before and I'll explain it again, there are several different applications for the term works. You have works of the law, which means the specifically prescribed actions required by the law of Moses if one was to be deemed righteous. Those are the works of the law. The Word of God tells us, For you are saved by grace through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The writer is not telling us that you have no actions, you have no deeds that accompany your faith to bring about salvation. That is not what the writer is saying, and it's asinine to even try to uh -huh. interpret that in that way. Amen. I have argued for years and years. I grew up in the Assembly of God Church. And I love when people come to me, Baptist, Church of Christ, well, Church of Christ not so much. Uh, they believe in the essentiality of baptism for salvation. Uh, but your Baptist, your Assembly of God, your Church of God, you know, your so-called fundamentalist churches, and they will come us, oh no, you're saved by faith alone. Faith alone. And I say, really? I grew up in the Assemblies of God Church. And even as a young person in the Assemblies of God Church, I could see the contradiction in our teaching. I could see where we were saying one thing out of one corner of our mouth and saying something else out of the other corner of our mouth. The Word of God teaches, according to the assemblies of God, all you need to do to be saved, again, taking Scripture out of context, but we won't go into all that, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Therefore, 
All you have to do to be saved is confess with your mouth, believe in your heart. Honey, I got news for you. That is faith with action. Mm -hmm. Confess with your mouth. When Jimmy Swaggart used to do his crusades before he got found out and all of a sudden his crowds dwindled and he couldn't get anybody to come to a crusade anymore. But before all that happened, Billy Graham, when he, Billy Graham does his big crusades, they had their little altar call. And I grew up in this environment. I, I've been in so many services where this was done. You know, I can, I can do it. Just like this, with every head bowed and every eye closed. I want to ask tonight, do you need Jesus? Do you need to be saved? Do you need God to come into your life and turn things around for you? Glory to God. Hallelujah. If you do, nobody's looking. All eyes are closed. Folks, I'm telling you, I could be any one of 8 million preachers right now. If you'll just raise your hand and indicate, Preacher, I want to be saved. Preacher, I want the Lord to save me. Hallelujah. Oh, I see that hand. I see that hand. Yes, I see that hand, brother. God bless you. I see that hand, sister. God bless you. Am I doing it on the dot or on You are. You are. I'm hitting it right on the head, Tommy. If you'd ever been him, you'd have seen that's exactly how it went. And then the next thing would be, let's all stand. Now I want to ask those of you that raised your hands. I want you to step out in faith right now. I want you to come down to this altar. Just come out of your seat. Find the courage. Find the faith in your heart. Don't just believe, but step out and, and come to this altar. Yes, yes, here they come. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, sister, you're coming. Yes, brother, you're coming. Oh, hallelujah, they're coming, folks. Praise God, they're coming. Thank you, Jesus, they're coming. Then they come to the altar. And you got folks standing across the altar in the front of the building crying and weeping. And I don't discount the experience they're having. Don't misunderstand me. I believe the Lord's touching their life, and I believe they're touching Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then the next step's going to be, I'm going to pray a prayer. And as I pray, I want you to repeat the words that I speak. And I want you to believe what you're saying as you say. How in the world can I believe what you're saying? I'm repeating it right after you've said it. I don't even have time in my brain to process what's being said. Mm -hmm. That's right. To determine if I really believe it or not. Mm -hmm. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. I believe you died for me. I believe you died for me. I believe you went to the cross for my sin. I believe you went to the cross for my sin. I believe you rose on the third day from the grave. I believe you rose on the third day on the grave. And at the end of the prayer, and now I'm saved. And now I'm saved. Oh, hallelujah. Everybody claps. Got a whole bunch of new converts. How do you ain't got a bunch of new converts? Uh -huh. Preach it. You got a bunch of people that just prayed. You got a bunch of people that just believed. You got a bunch of people that have just made me repent it and turn to God from unbelief. But you do not have a biblically born again child of God. Amen. And furthermore, you're a liar if you say you believe in faith-only salvation. Because if you believe in faith-only salvation, why did you call them to the altar? Why did you ask them to repeat the prayer after you? Uh-huh. <laughs> because you believe to be saved, they have to pray the sinner's prayer. That's the term that fundamentalists use. The sinner's prayer. Look at tracts printed by, by 
fundamentalist organizations. And on the back, they're going to say, if you've read this pamphlet and you feel God touching you and you feel the Lord, then, then here's words. We're printing a prayer. You pray this prayer. Speak this prayer. And you'll be saved. They give you the words. Mm -hmm. What is it? A magic formula? You just speak these words. Abracadabra, hocus pocus, Jesus name, and now I focus. I am saved, oh hallelujah. <laughs> Stupidity, folks. But the truth of the matter is, nobody believes in salvation without deed, without works, without some form of action. The Word of God nowhere, nowhere do we see in the history of the early Christian church anybody who is called saved who simply believed the gospel and did nothing whatsoever in response to that faith. Right. Nowhere, nowhere is anybody identified as saved. Nowhere do we see Peter leading people in the sinner's prayer. But you let us one God, Jesus name, apostolic people come along and tell folk you need to repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And these people will jump down your throat and claim that you're preaching a works message. Uh -huh. It is a lie and a distortion from hell. Uh -huh. Because first of all, we're not preaching the works of the law, number one. Secondly, we are not preaching good works. Good works are your personal efforts at doing good in an effort to win salvation by reason of your good works. Therefore, when the apostle tells us, for by grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, there are two applications to that term works that apply here. Number one, you cannot be saved by the works of the law. That's right. The Old Testament is completed, it is finished, it has been sealed, it is over, that contract has been fulfilled. You can live up to every jot and tittle of that law and still die unsaved. Amen. Because you don't know Jesus. Secondly, you couldn't be good enough to earn heaven. That's right. You can't do enough to win God's favor. God made a way for you to be saved. He provided the man Jesus Christ. The blood that was spilled on Calvary was spilled in sacrificial fashion for the sin of all lost humanity. And whosoever will embrace and believe and obey this gospel shall be saved. Amen. But you cannot be saved outside of God's divine subscription. Prescription. Let me rephrase that. Prescription. God has prescribed what we must do to be saved. And uh -huh. honey, you better do it God's way or don't bother at all. Uh-huh. Amen. And the prescription that we see clearly articulated throughout the entire book of Acts, which is why we did a very extensive lengthy, I mean, how many months, six months we spent going through the entire book of Acts. Uh -huh. And when you go through the entire book of Acts, you see the message that is consistently preached in every city, in every quarter, to every person of every nationality, of every uh -huh. color, of every language, of every background, is the message of Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That is God's prescribed plan. Amen. 
And yes, it involves works. Uh -huh. It involves actions. It involves deeds. God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, said in Mark, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Right there, he makes it clear that faith alone will not do the trick. There has to be action. Baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sin is God's prescribed response to faith. Uh -huh. If you believe the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ... Honey, I don't care what First Baptist tells you. I don't care what First Assembly of God tells you or First Church of God tells you. If you believe this gospel, the first thing you ought to do is run to the water to be buried in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. It is that action which is performed through obedience to our faith. It's worthless if you don't believe the message. That's right. Nobody's saying that baptism in Jesus' name will save an unbeliever. Nobody teaches that. Nobody right. preaches that. Therefore, to try to suggest we're preaching a works message is asinine. Uh -huh. That's right. Pure garbage. No. You must believe followed by obey. Right. You can go through the motion if you want to without believing and figure, well, I'll just cover my bets, you know, just in case I die and find out there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. I'll go ahead and be baptized in Jesus' name. But I don't really believe all this. Well, I got news for you. All you're doing is getting wet. The Word of God teaches us that the name of Jesus, it's not just the name. The name is not a magic amulet that does for everybody. No, it's that name through faith in His name. Therefore, if you don't have faith in the ability... Oh, hallelujah. If you don't have faith in the ability of that name to wash your sins away, then, sweetheart, you're just getting wet. Uh-huh. So nobody in the apostolic movement is teaching a works message, meaning that there is some action you can take that will cause you to be saved aside from and separate from faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody is teaching that in all of the apostolic faith. Amen. And I get tired of people misrepresenting the teaching in our churches. I get sick and tired of it. I saw an article online not too long ago. Uh, this full Trinitarian guy was trying to present, you know, the apostolic message as a works message. And, you know, oh, they they just completely ignore the cross. And they just completely ignore, oh, what a bunch of garbage. We have the right we have the privilege, we have the ability to follow the example of the Lord Jesus Christ and enter the waters of baptism to be buried in His name because of what He did at Calvary. Uh -huh. Amen. Not in spite of, because of. Uh -huh. We know when we go into that water that that water is available to us, that what God has promised to do for us in that water is because of the cross. Uh -huh. And nobody says any different. Amen. My Lord, have mercy. I'm going to preach a little. <laughs> Sean, turn your volume down a little bit. <laughs> Let's read then what James says. See, I've been articulating. I haven't even read what he said yet. <clears throat> Verses 14 through 26. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Again, defined as action. Hath not action. Can faith save him? It's a question. Verse 15. He gives an example. He said, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, 
Notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? Even so. Even so. Those two words. That means the thought continues. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. So James says, somebody comes to you and says, Oh, pastor, pray for me. I have no groceries. I have no food. I need to feed my kids, and I don't have anything to feed them. And I pray for them. Oh, Lord, help them, Lord. Give them food, Jesus. Bless them, Lord. And then I pat them on the back and say, Now you go and bless God. It'll be all right. But I don't do something to physically, literally, immediately respond to that need. James says, what good is that? What good? You've done no good. He said, even so, faith without action is dead, being alone. He said, faith works the same way. If you don't do something in response to your faith, it is dead. Honey, I've got news for you. Dead means it is worthless to you. It does you no good. It can serve you no good purpose whatsoever. So if you've got faith, or you claim to have faith, but it does not motivate you to act, your faith, my friend, is bogus. Uh -huh. Because real faith will motivate you to act. I've used this example many times over the last 30 years or so. And personally, I like it because in my mind, it is a very, very clear, simple illustration of this principle. If a man ran in this building right this minute and was screaming and hollering, the building's on fire, the building's on fire, y'all need to get out. This building's on fire. I believe you, sir. I believe you. Yes, I do. This building's on fire. If he's right, then I'm a piece of bacon. Because I claim to believe him, but I'm not acting upon what he's telling me. If I really believe what he's telling me, I'm going to do what? I'm going to get up and I'm going to go out the exit. Because faith without action is meaningless. Faith without action is dead being alone. And this is the principle that James articulates in his epistle that many in the modern church refuse to accept. Uh -huh. They flat reject it. And yet, this principle, even if this book had never been written, even if James were never adopted as part of the canon of Scripture, this principle is found all throughout the Word of God. Uh -huh. That's right. As I've said before, nowhere in Scripture are we told to believe and that there not be any action or any activity or any obedience or any act or any deed associated with that belief. No. And nobody on this planet that I know of believes that it is so. Nobody believes. All you have to do is believe the gospel and you'll be saved. What about the word of God telling us that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart? Wake up, folks. Wake up. Right there you have the marriage of faith and deed. 
faith and action. Do you follow what I'm saying? So this, even if J all James did is articulate in very clear, precise fashion what the Word of God otherwise shows us anyway. So even if this book had never been written, the principle here would still be valid and legitimate. It would still apply. If somebody got up in a pulpit and said these very words, and the book of James did not exist to back him up word for word, he'd still be telling the truth. Uh -huh. Verse 17. He said, even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Verse 18, yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Do you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ? You know? How do I know that? Because I just told you. Hmm. Now in an apostolic church, we call people down to the altar, want to know God, and we instruct them that if they want to convert and repent and they want to have a relationship with God, that He has asked them to submit to water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. I can tell you who believes what I'm saying without anybody ever opening their mouth. Everybody gets in line for the baptistry. That's it. That's it. Everybody gets in line at that baptistry. Honey, they must believe what I'm saying. How do I know? By their works, by their action, by their deed. That's what James is saying here. Then he, he said, you know, you, you say you got faith. So I'll show you my faith by my works. My actions will demonstrate to you my faith, the existence, the presence of my faith. Then in verse 19, he said, thou believest that there is one God? Well, we do anyway. I don't know about first church down the road, but this church does. He said, Thou doest well, the devils also believe and tremble. Why in the world did James insert this specific verse in this specific place? It's very easy. They the devil in hell that saved. But every one of them believed. Thou believe it says one God? The devils believe. What's he talking about? He's talking about believing without the action, believing without the deed, believing without the works, quote unquote. He said the devils believe and tremble. They believe it so much it scares them to death. That doesn't make them saved. My Lord have mercy. He said, but wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works, without action, is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works, action, when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Mind you, notice the offering of Isaac on the altar was not a work of the law. The law did not ask Abraham to do that. It was not a good work. Abraham did not come up with this idea and decide to do this in an effort to gain God's favor. No. He's speaking of a specific thing which God himself asked Abraham to do. Oh, hallelujah. Let's run a while. <laughs> Glory to God. He said, was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he had offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar. He said God asked him to do it. Abraham did it. It was in a 
Abraham's acting upon what God asked him to do. Where that is where his justification lay. In his action. Oh, what did he do? He obeyed. I got news for you. Baptism in Jesus' name for the remission of sins is an issue of obedience. It's plain and simple. Plain and simple. It's not a work of the law. It is not a good work that you're trying to earn God's favor by some uh, invention of your own mind. Honey, it is God's prescribed action. God says, you believe, do this. And just like Abraham, if you really believe what God says, you're going to do it. Uh -huh. My Lord, have mercy. Look. Again, verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works? Again. Nobody is saying that the action alone accomplishes the job. You gotta have faith with the action. Amen. My Lord have mercy. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect, complete. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Here, James is literally what he is trying to do here, is help us understand the way that it is worded concerning Abraham, that Abraham believed God, doesn't say he believed and did thus and so. What James is trying to do here now, in verse number 23, is show that when you see the word believe, when you see the word faith, that action is automatically married to that. Because you can't have one without the other. Uh -huh. So he's saying, Abraham's called a friend of God. Abraham believed and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. But I've already showed you that his faith was demonstrated by his obedience. Mm -hmm. Therefore, when I just like when I talk about forgiveness, and I've told you, when you read the word forgiveness, you don't have to read in every single reference if that person comes to you and repents. But it is implied and it is built in. To the very term forgiveness. Forgiveness uh -huh. is a two-way street. It requires an acknowledgement of the sin. It requires repentance. So therefore, you automatically know this. That's what James is saying here. It says, when it says that Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. It said, when you read that word believe, immediately you know that the action was part of his belief. Because faith without works is dead. So if all he did was believe, there would be no righteousness. But because he believed and obeyed, his faith was imputed unto him for righteousness. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. Ye see then how that by works, by action, a man is justified and not by faith only. Verse 25, likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works, by action, when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? He said, God literally imputed righteousness upon this woman, not because of what she believed in her heart, but what, because what she did. Mm -hmm. she was. And this was a prostitute. This was a whore. And God said, but you know what? There's something in her that was manifested 
in her behavior. There was something in her of a godly sort. There was something in her of a good nature that was manifested in her obedience. Oh, children, I could get into an affirming uh. message right about now. When you come to the house of God, when you make every effort to serve God, when you make every effort to know God and live for God, honey, I got news for you. God sees that intent and purpose of your heart, hallelujah to God, and it is imputed unto you for righteousness. Hallelujah. Finally, he says in verse 26, For as the body without the spirit is dead... So faith without works is dead also. You, you say the word faith and immediately action is implied. Action is built into the term faith. Because just as the spirit brings the, the body to life, even so action brings our faith to life. Or excuse me, let me rephrase that. Our faith brings our actions to life. So without faith, so without works, faith, my Lord have mercy, I'm going to say this. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. It is the faith, that, it is the works, the action that brings our faith to life. And as I've said before, when you, when, you know how many times you see a car driving down the road and you say, well, that car almost hit me. No, it didn't. That driver almost hit you. But you don't mention the driver. But there's a driver inside the car. This van almost ran me over today. No, it didn't. This man driving a van almost ran you over today. Do you follow what I'm saying? Well, this is what James is saying. Inside the body is the spirit bringing the body to life. Inside our, fa inside our faith is action bringing our faith to life. When you refer to faith, you're not just speaking about the vehicle. You're talking about the driver, which is action. Do you follow? It's built in. It's implied. It's immediate. It's there at all times, 24-7. Hallelujah to God. I believe we made it through this much next week. Oh, we made it through chapter 2. Hallelujah.